Okay, that's in here. Can you can you go with Greg actually to get that? Ladies and gentlemen. Hand, hand sanitizer. Anybody want some? Courtesy, courtesy of the good folks of Dwayne Reed. Uh, I can't see any of you, but welcome. To, uh, what do you think? Up here, maybe? No? All right. Did I too loud? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just talk right here. Nice to meet you. I'm Guides. Um, how many of you here were in this talk last year? Two, well, there wasn't a con last year. So this is actually two years ago, so you're all liars. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is going to be a different thing. Last, last time we were on tour, so we had a, t a shit ton of equipment. Uh, but this, the main difference this year is we do have liquid nitrogen. So uh, if we could just call uh, Death Veggie over here to test out the liquid nitrogen to make sure it's liquid nitrogen. I'm not putting two pieces in there yet. <laughs> blowing, it, blowing it earlier. Woo! Is it liquid nitrogen? All right, all right, beautiful. So, uh, so Jules right here is going to be, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jules. He's going to make it. Some, all right, I will. I'll stand right here. All right, I will. It's a nice mic. All right, I'll just sit here and talk then. Uh, so my name is Guiz. We've been doing this thing called food hacking for a while. A couple of years ago, maybe we didn't really have a much of a. Um, uh, yeah, we were kind of one of the um, the very few non-computer talks here at Hope, and. Uh, now, of course, there's tons of non-computer talks at Hope. You're, you're hacking sex, and you're hacking um, you know, the uterus, and the, the penis, and the, the other organs. They're all organ-based, and so we are too, which is the stomach and the, and the tongue. So how many of you here cook? All right, how many of you here eat? All right, good, good. And how many of you here have ever uh, cooked with us before? Raise your hand. One, two, three. All right, cool, so can you guys come up here and help us pass out stuff, if you can? <laughs> So we're going to make a bunch of, uh, so uh, Jules has uh, been working on this cake. We're, I don't know, I've been, how many here of you here like celery? Kind of gross, right? I don't know, some people really don't like celery. So one of the themes of the talk is going to be reclaiming celery. And so uh, it's, we're going to reclaim celery from, and this is really, this kind of ties into what Bicycle Mark was talking about with a lot of the food, um, kind of the Industrial Revolution kind of screwing up food in a lot, a lot of ways where you stop, you know, there's something like there's 1% of food varietals available now as, of, as there were 100 years ago. Just, you know, there's thousands of types of fruits, of, of fruits and vegetables that are totally gone now uh, because they're, they're just going to grow tomatoes because they, you know, tomatoes are the shapes that are, that, that are good to be put in cans. So they're basically getting rid of a lot of food and celery kind of turns out to this gross thing. And so let me just describe this dessert really quick before we pass it out. Um, so you guys come up. I'm, I'm just gonna so he's just going to put them on these things and then um, again, go ahead and start pouring liquid nitrogen. So do, you, do the... Uh, Okay, so we're just going to set up. This is a this is a celery root cake with uh, cel sugared celery root on top of it. There's a celery seed uh, uh, glaze on uh, in it as well, and there's also a it's a time frosting, and we're going to have a liquid nitrogen kind of celery root liqueur on top of it. I'll stop bending over into the thing. So um, this is going to be really good. It's going to be like celery. Does anyone here like celery root? Has anyone ever heard of celery root? Raise your hand. All right, beautiful. So celery root, you know, it's a big knobby thing with celery growing out of it, and you can kind of make a carrot cake out of it, and it's really nice and kind of addicted to it. And so we, used to, we made this one, uh, this one dessert. I'll kind of get back to my notes for a second. Uh, Savory.jpg. Is that right? We made this really nice dessert once called uh, Gang of Four Celeries that was a... Um, that was a, it's four celeries. It was a celery seed cracker bread uh, and then a celery, kind of shredded celery root inside of it. And then we have, so here's Jules making the celery root, cra or celery seed cracker bread. And then we had, uh, you know, celery leaves inside of it, celery root shredded, and then we made a celery heart vinaigrette and kind of tied it together and then put truffles on top of it, of course. So it was like four different kinds of celery just to kind of like explore, because, I don't know, did everyone grow up having like ants on a log with like peanut butter and pimento? It's pretty nice, right? So I don't know, it's just kind of bringing back that flavor. So a little, um, get back to my talk notes, a little introduction about me. I'm a hacker chef. Is anyone else here a hacker chef? Way more than last time. Good job, guys. So hacking is a lot like science. Um, uh, hacking is a lot like um, cooking, I think. So I've written computer software for a while, and when I get sick of that, I kind of go into the cooking mode, right? Because you can you know, write computer software for a while, but it's not really accessible a lot to people who aren't 
computer freaks, right? You can write a piece of software for a girl or a boy or whatever you're into having sex with, and maybe they'll be impressed with it, maybe if they're the right person, but not usually, right? But if you, uh, if you make someone a meal, it's like a chemical assault on them, right? It's like you're releasing serotonin in their brains and stuff like that. So I kind of get sick of food and go back to computers, I get sick of computers and go back to food. So this talk's gonna be kind of a, like, about those two kind of things combined. Um, so I've worked in some restaurants, I went to cooking school. I worked at a restaurant called The Fat Duck in, um, in, uh, in England. It's kind of a molecular gastronomy place. So I worked in the lab there, so we had you know, uh, vacuum chambers and centrifuges. You puree a tomato, put it in, spin it at 4,000 RPM, and you have a puck of you know, tomato at the bottom that's the pigment, that's red, and then the flavor on top. Siphon that off and make a tomato sorbet, a white tomato sorbet. So it's like a lot of weird science-y stuff. We had you know, vacuum, um, Vacuum pumps hooked up to ovens, right? So you can be cooking something, but then draw all the air out of it uh, so that uh, your meringues go up extra high, right? Because there's a vacuum inside. Let me just check on this for a second. If, uh, So uh, right now we're going to start with uh, the liquid nitrogen stuff. So Jules is going to pour some liquid nitrogen into this bowl. Um, and then we have this uh, egg white uh, celery liqueur foam that's in this. Who knows what this is? <laughs> Anyone recognize this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Surprised you can even have enough brain cells to remember to raise your hand. So I'm sure many of us have lost many brain cells to nitrous oxide, but it actually has a culinary use, which is that it's you know, really quickly aerating something and, and, and chilling it as well. So we, we fill that uh, nitrous siphon up with egg whites and um, a celery root liqueur, and we're going to uh, uh, kind of foam it up onto a, a spoon, and it's going to be this nice puffy thing of egg whites, which you don't really want to eat because it's raw, right? But then we're going to cook the egg whites in liquid nitrogen, because liquid nitrogen is negative 191 degrees, and so we're going to, there we go, liquid nitrogen right there. Uh, it denatures the protein of the egg whites, right? It actually coagulates the egg white protein, so it cooks it by super freezing it, right? So uh, it's going to be really nice. We're going to have these little puffs on top of these things, and as soon as, veggie, as soon as those are ready, as soon as, um, so everyone out over there, just like take two at a time and just start passing them out to everyone you can. So we've got 100 plates, so I don't know how many people are in this room. Uh, try and get one. You know, um, try and fight your way to the front if you want. It should be really, really good. So, uh, Jules, is it all good? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, I live at the Unicorn Precinct 13, uh, Jules Veggie. Who here has lived at the Unicorn Precinct 13? Anybody else? It's kind of a, it's kind of a hacker, yeah, it's kind of a hacker bed and breakfast. Uh, it's in San Francisco, California. It's, um, let me see if I can minimize this to look through it. Here's some pictures of it. This is the red room. We have uh, a bunch of people have kind of stayed there and write software and cook. This is our kitchen. Pretty, pr pretty proud of it. It's in San Francisco. This is our cookbook shelf. We have 180, 190 cookbooks. Um, this is some of the equipment we have in the kitchen. This is a beautiful mural. And so Unicorn Precinct 13 is kind of, uh, there's our zine rack. There's Zaz and Joe Grand at a supper club repairing our vacuum press. So Unicorn Precinct 13 is kind of uh, one of the projects we have out there is food hacking. So every Thursday night, five to 35 people come over and we all cook dinner together. Together, right, and, I, and we have like you know centrifuge, vacuum chamber, all this kind of crazy stuff, liquid nitrogen stuff, and so it's a, it's an opportunity for people to cook together and like express that communal aesthetic instead of going to a restaurant, you know, where you're working, you're, people who maybe work there don't really like their jobs, maybe don't really like you as a. Uh, as a, as a customer, and so people are putting hate into their food. And so when you kind of go home for the holidays, your mom or your dad is cooking, they're cooking you great food because they love you, right? And when you get out, you hang out, how many of you here cook with your roommates? Dinner parties? People are doing that more and more, right? So like, you know, you, you, so we get together once, or, uh, once a week, Thursday, you know, we start cooking around, we start prepping between six and eight. I go shopping at like five. People chip in about 10 bucks for groceries just to cover costs. And uh, people come over between six and eight. First course is by eight, desserts by 10. And, and you know, we kind of clean the kitchen. Otherwise, there's no more supper club because our kitchen gets really trashed. We go through every dish. And so this is a, that's kind of a, a supper, this is a picture from a supper club where we have Zaz and Joe Grand from uh, some Discover TV channel. Joe Grand from The Loft and Zaz from Rotten, uh, kind of all, all kind of hanging out and cooking. In fact, there's a, uh, there's a video here on Ryan is Hungry that kind of, I'm not going to play any audio from it, but uh, you should check it out later. It kind of has some video of, uh, of what a supper club looks like, so maybe I'll just kind of run that in the background. Um, Maybe I'll mute that because it's really horrible. So here's kind of everyone kind of talking and hanging out in our kitchen and making dinner together. So we've been doing this for about three and a half years, right? And so there are, under, how many here have you been to an underground supper club? You know what those are? People kind of like, yeah, so you go and you pay 40, 50 bucks for like fancy food in someone's house. And the trick about that is it's, they're kind of circumventing the, uh, hey, guys, how's the cake, by the way? I haven't tried it. Yeah, hey, good. All right, so. How much of this uh, hand sanitizer am I supposed to put on each piece? <laughs> right. It's actually celery flavored hand sanitizer, so go crazy. Reclaiming celery. Um, yeah, so we're just, uh, we're just, um, 
uh, whatever the hell I was just talking about. So we've been having these supper clubs. So the difference between an underground supper club is where you pay 50 or $60 to go to someone's house, and you're kind of circumventing like health code laws and stuff like that, and getting really cool fancy food. Maybe you have some endangered food, you know, muskrat or something like that, uh, blue whale, whatnot. And so we have, uh, we have people that are, so that we have like a, a communal supper club where people kind of show up. I'm an anarchist myself, so it's like being an anarchist head chef where you're not really telling, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this, kind of like we're doing here. It's more <laughs> suggesting, like, have you ever made pasta before? What should we put in the pasta? And we go to the, you know, the farmer's market or the market, um, other markets in, in San Francisco and kind of get the nice produce. And we're kind of blessed with California produce. And so that kind of drives the menu and we, you know, make a lot of interesting stuff. A couple weeks ago, say it again? Oh yeah, chocolate squid. Okay, so here's a really good story. Oh, yeah. Veggies visiting from New York or uh, London or wherever the hell you are, York, York. <laughs> it's close enough, York, New York. The old York, and uh, and he, you know he said we're having a dinner party that night, and uh, he tries to wake me up at eight in the morning, and I've been up until three, so it's, I'm really unhappy about that. And so he says we're, I'm going. He says let's go to the farmers market. We're going to do dinner tonight. And I said whatever you get from the farmers market is good. Just fucking go get something, and uh, we'll, we'll make it. So an hour later, uh, he barges into my room and throws a bag of giant squid on my bed. And we're talking like gigantic squid, like three foot tall squid. And so I got him back and said, okay, we're going to do chocolate squid. So, uh, anyone had chocolate oh, yeah. squid before? Yeah. How, did you, how was it? What did you think? Fantastic. Yeah. So good. Agneska says it's amazing, so that's good. So we had chocolate squid. You know, we did like a chocolate fennel velouté and kind of, you know, grilled the squid and did a lot of cool shit with it. Um, so we have these supper clubs. We have people kind of coming over and cooking all the time. And so uh, two years ago, when we did the last stuff, we were in the middle of a food hacking tour. So we did a... Um, we did a West, an East Coast tour. Let me, let me find the, uh, the thingy for it. We did all these dates. We, uh, we did it's a five-week dinner party tour. Uh, we drove for 10,000 miles from San Francisco to Maine to Florida and back. We were in New York for a week. We did 16 dinner parties in 32 days. Um, we would like, drive for eight or nine hours, pull into Chicago, go to the farmer's market, go to our friend's house, cook dinner with 25 people, and then you know, clean the place, wake up in the morning, and drive to Ohio. We were, in San, we were in New York for a week. We did, this, we did this talk here. That's why we had more equipment and kind of more people and a bunch of cookbooks. Uh, it was really fun. We drove up to Maine. Uh, we visited my little brother on this uh, kind of um, Northeast Kingdom Buddhist retreat colony. And you had like 25 Buddhist people just drinking and you know, making all sorts of weird food from their beautiful farm. We were down in New Orleans where it was so hot. So we did like seven courses of cold food. It was a lot of fun because we got to cook with our friends and family, right? We got to... Um, Sometimes when you go on a road tour, you're on tour with a band or something, you go and get drunk with your friends or you go to a show, and it's, it's kind of fun. But we were doing that too, but we were actually like hanging out and um, cooking with them and like expressing something together. How's it going, guys? Is it all right? Yeah, it's cold. It's all right. Happening. Beautiful. So, uh, so this is kind of our, our food hacking tour, and we did another tour um, that, that uh, winter where we did a three-week tour in... Um, uh, of a week in Portland, a week in Seattle, and a week in LA. And we started doing hack labs there where we are actually, you know, here's our Portland hack lab. Uh, I don't know if there's actually pictures of these. Oh yeah, there are. So we did a Portland hack lab where we made all these different kinds of dried limes and we, we, started, uh, we started evolving this like hack lab idea. The, sh the Seattle hack lab was the most amazing because we brought all this equipment up there and Seattle is what? what what's, what's good in Seattle? Anyone from Seattle? What's the big food there? Coffee, what else? <laughs> salmon, right. So the salmon in, in Seattle is amazing. Uh, and the vegan food for some reason. Everyone's vegan up in, everyone up is vegan up in Seattle. So we had this, uh, we had this uh, friend of ours set up, uh, set up um, this hack lab. And so our hack labs, um, man, let me just talk about this other hack lab really quickly. This was the vegan hack lab where we made vegan blood. How many of you here are goth? And how many are vegan goth? See, the deal is, what kind of blood do vegan goths drink, right? <laughs> And so we, we, uh, we did this blood lab because we were doing a lot of blood at the time. We were doing a lot of like blood ice cream, uh, pork blood ice cream and pork, what's, uh, oh yeah, blood hacks. Here we go. So you go on our wiki. So this is, so you say, what, is, what does hacking have to do with food? We have a wiki. There you go. Right. And we have open source recipe development. And we make weird equipment and we'll go into that in a little bit. And we have some culinary software, which we'll go into a little bit too. So we have uh, a black custard, right, which is this, uh, it's kind of like, it's like cream and pork blood, right? And then you mix it in, you kind of, you know, can pour it out and it's, uh, it's really nice and we put a, um, uh, onion mustard foam on top and a caramelized uh, apple, and it was Passover too. I don't know how many people here are uh, of the faith. Jewish vegan goths? Right, Jewish vegan goths. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. Right, so we, uh, so we, made, this, we made this black custard. This, this is actually for a, a dinner party for, how many here you know what Rotten.com is? Rotten.com. A little hands up for Rotten.com, right? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so we, we're, so we were all with Rotten, and uh, we had a Rotten dinner where we tried to make as many gross things as possible. Yeah, right? What fell? Oh, 
Oh, it's all good. Strix, Strix just froze himself. Uh, okay, so we, we had a rotten dinner, uh, which is one of our dinner parties. A friend of mine was over from England, and we made a lot of gross food. We had uh, durian. We had, this is black oil cod. We made a black olive oil, right? Which is, you know, we, we took a bunch of pichelin olives, cut them in half, uh, um, did them in five changes of water. We just blanched them with, like, boiling water to kind of get the briny flavor out. And then we put them in a dehydrator so that the olive, all the water would go away. So you have just, like, kind of pure fat and solids, and then blitz that with olive oil. So you have, like, not an emulsified black olive oil, but like a real black olive oil. And so we kind of, um, we poached this black cod in that by filling up a little sous vide like vacuum bag with this cod and this oil and kind of just really slowly cooked it. And so uh, we had some other gross stuff at Rotten. Um, this is deconstruct, this is a durian. Anyone here know what durian fruit is? It smells like poop. It's gross, right? Or <laughs> I would have also accepted corpse. Um, it also <laughs> smells like corpse, but it goes really well with pecan pie, right? for some reason. So anyway, that's, that's, that's why we did the black custard, right? And then uh, we had some of this blood custard. Uh, we actually had some left over in the fridge and because uh, I wanted to try and make um, kind of a creme brulee out of it. Everyone knows what creme brulee is, right? So we sprinkled a little bit of sugar on top of it when it was cold and we kind of torched it and tasted exactly like a scab, you know? Because it was like, it was, it was cold and uh, tasted like iron, kind of really heavy. I it was a healthy pig that gave our blo their blood to this. So that was a bad idea, right? So there are, that's, that's one of the things about Hack Labs when you're sitting around messing, messing around with stuff in the kitchen because the same thing with hacking is if hacking is just geeking out as much as you can about a system and trying to figure out things to do with it that no one's ever done before, same thing with food, same thing with dancing, same thing with sex, same thing with anything you can really hack. And so as our Hack Labs, we kind of sit down and say, what are some wrong things we can do with food? Like uh, we had a, a wormwood, we had a New Orleans meal one time, so we're like, oh, we're going to make wormwood mayonnaise, right? And then make a wormwood potato salad. It was horrible. It was really, it was totally unedible. But we did some other, but you know, you learn from those things, right? And that's the whole point of, of kind of succeeding and learning in the world is being able to fail and setting yourself up to fail. Um, so, I, okay, so we we're talking about the vegan blood. Oh yeah, the hack labs. So we had these, um, we had the Portland hack lab, the Seattle hack lab. So in Seattle, uh, you know, we had a, a dinner up there. We were up there for Thanksgiving. We made a vegan turducken, right? So turducken, as everyone knows, is the chicken stuff inside the duck stuff inside the turkey. It's a Roman recipe where they keep going up to a cow, right? And then the inside is a finch, and then there's a truffle inside the finch, and you eat the truffle and sacrifice the rest to Zeus, right? That's all I... Because they're the Romans. That's how they roll. They're decadent as fuck. They're like... They're like they're, that's just what they do. Am I right? Is there anyone here who knows about Roman history on the stage? Decadent as fuck, right? Yes, yes very decadent. All right, so, uh, so we, uh, we kind of made a vegan... Um, yeah, it's actually Fivic, though, is it, isn't it? Is this the V, the Roman V? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so we made a vegan turducken. It was called the burdocken because, you know, you want the, it's like burdock inside salsify inside a uh, leek. It was just a big log with, like, different layers of vegetables. It's kind of cute. Now, how many vegans are in the room, by the way? Vegans? You can raise your hands. You know, the thing I hate about vegan food... But, but, the, but that I love is the, is, the, is the trying to make the fake meat thing, because vegetables, vegetables are just so good, right? You just want to jump in and make the vegetables awesomely. And the way you do that, of course, is by roasting the hell out of them. You burn the hell out of them. This is the difference between like steamed Brussels sprouts and roasted Brussels sprouts, or steamed corn and roasted corn. When you roast these things, you're making these Maillard flavors, which is an amino acid and producing sugar, kind of exploding into these beautiful, roasty tasting things. And that's why, of course, you add wine to make a sauce when you're, when you're doing a steak or something, or for vegans, you're doing it, you know, tofu or whatever. Uh, you're, you're trying to get the brown flavor off, and I really am not trying to talk shit about vegans. I love, I love cooking vegan food, but, uh, but you know, you're trying to get that brown stuff that's off the bottom of the pan back into the thing, right? Um, so it's like kind of why you deglaze or whatever. So we had these vegan hack labs up in Seattle. We did the Seattle hack lab where it was all about coffee and salmon. So we had a vacuum chamber here. Okay, we had a couple people who came and brought some really interesting hardware. There's a ball roaster. Does anyone have their balls roasted? That's what a ball roaster is. So a ball roaster right there is, uh, it's kind of, you know, in the fields of, you know, Venezuela or Brazil or whatever. You kind of throw, you know, you, you kind of harvest the, the, the coffee beans. And you kind of throw a couple in the roaster. It's over some propane and you kind of cup your coffee right there. So people who were, we had a friend um, at, this supper, at this hack lab that was a roaster for Zoka. And so he brought his ball, he made a bicycle powered espresso machine. Right, and so what's the hard part of an espresso machine? Because he made, you know, for Burning Man. Burning Man freaks, they want to do, they want their espresso in the middle of the desert. That's what they want at Burning Man. Burning Man, big festival in the middle of the desert. It's a bicycle-powered espresso machine that builds up the pressure that you need, right, to make that steam. Uh, and so one, part of that was a bicycle-powered ball roaster. And so we were, uh, we, we brought our vacuum chamber and we brought some essential oils, right? And so we had, we had three kinds of uh, coffee beans. We had like Sumatran, Colombian, and, um, and Ethiopian beans, and we kind of did little tests with, this, with these coffees. We kind of like laid them out and cupped them, and we put the green beans in a vacuum chamber while they're still green and they still have some water in them with uh, essential oils. So we had like, you know, bergamot essential oil and um, 
uh, camphor essential oil, which kind of smells like mothballs, right? And then we roasted these beans after we, so we were kind of doing tests on which of these beans tasted good with different, um, oh man, how's that going? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you threw it, filled up the rest of it, and the nitrous is right here. That's a bad sound. How many of you have here? Have had, how many of you have had the cake so far? What do you think? All right, beautiful. Jules, amazing, amazing cake. Here's some more nitrous. Uh, don't let veggie near it. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so we basically took these green coffee beans, vacuum tumbled them with essential oils, and then roasted them to see how that affected the flavor. And then we kind of cupped them all and tried it. And like the Colombian beans already had like camphor notes. And so it was interesting because you drink the coffee, but your mouth would kind of cool down because you have this like camphor flavor in it. And Ethiopian bean already had, um, Ethiopian beans already had some citrus notes. So the bergamot really tasted good um, with that. Uh, we also had a roaster. We had um, a garbage can uh, smoker rather. And so we used each of the beans as the smoking material for salmon. So we had like, you know, Ethiopian coffee smoked salmon and Colombian coffee smoked salmon. So we got to try all those too. And we kind of took, took notes, which are all on this wiki page, right? We also did this like really interesting um, kind of a sugar hack. So there's a thing called a Cuban shot. In Seattle, everyone goes crazy with coffee, where they sprinkle a little bit of sugar on top of the espresso grounds and pull it through it and it makes it a little sweeter. So we did a little research, a little reading at Powell's Books in uh, Portland about what sugars are in coffee, right? And it's mostly glu glucose and fructose are the main ones, right? And so of course, when you put table sugar onto it, that's sucrose. It's not, it's some glucose, but it's sucrose, right? And so we we tried with a bunch of different sugars. So here's, you can kind of see what sugars we used. We caramelized a couple of them. And we tried, and we did like, I'd never had coffee before at this point in my life, by the way. So we literally had like 19 coffees. And I was up for about nine days. And uh, on the 20th day, I finally went to the bathroom. Uh, it was, um, I don't know why that does that. So, so we tried a bunch of different sugars and we found out that like it was, you know, half fructose, half caramelized glucose, really tasted nice and sweet, but like coffee sweet, right? It wasn't actually just like sugar being added to this thing. So that's just a little idea of some of the hack labs and um, I, rec I, I recommend you just do it. You just, you just go to the store and you get some stuff you want to mess with and you say, you, know, you go get a bunch of Brazilian, Brazilian fruits are all the rage now, like acai and cashew. You just go get them all and have a little tasting test and try and do stuff with them. And I invite you to look at our wiki about uh, some of the other hack labs. Okay, so this is kind of uh, talking a little bit about, and again, you're documenting something, right? You're documenting and sharing it, which is restaurants don't do that, right? They're very secret about their recipes and you can go to work at the restaurant and maybe you learn the stuff, but that's the main difference between kind of you know, food hacking. When I was working at the Fat Duck, you go in, this $200 a plate restaurant, you go in, there's a guy with with a ruby on his forehead, right? And it's like, how, how do poor people get that food, right? And how do those recipes get out there for other people to use? And so that's kind of what we're about as far as uh, like open source um, recipe development. Um, and then we've also made a bunch of zines. We have, uh, how many here make zines? Raise your hand, zines, anyone? I know what a zine is? You guys know what a zine is, right? All right, good. So we, uh, you know, we, we kind of have a zine stapler and we staple each, each dinner. We kind of like write the menu in it. Um, if there's none left, just pass it out with, a, with the rest of the cake, I guess, if it's, if it's screwing up. What's the glaze on top of the cake, Jules? Oh, it's, uh, it's uh, just, you know, regular butter and powdered sugar icing with thyme. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's thyme. butter, icing, sugar, and thyme, thyme syrup that he made uh, yesterday in Brooklyn. This is a Brooklyn-made dessert. I think you guys should know that. Um, so, uh, we, so we make zines for the dinner parties where we kind of write the menu in there and kind of pass it around to everyone at the dinner party and say, you know, write your favorite dish in. Then we can kind of go back and kind of see what our favorite, what our favorite meals were. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the reclaiming celery aspect of this, which is I never, I tried, this is where this, that one dessert kind of, or that one dish kind of came from. It actually didn't use celery, but it had all the aspects of celery, the seed, the root, the hearts, and the leaves, but it didn't actually have celery in it. And so I think uh, in, in terms of the industrial revolution kind of destroying access to food, I live in, how many of you live in California? No one? couple people. So think about California as it produces so much of the country's produce, right? And so how much fuel is being used to drive California produce to the rest of the country? A lot, right? And so that's like one of the you know, ways we get off of oil dependence is, well, I, I'm sure um, Bicycle Mark was talking about this too, is you have local gardens. How many of you here know what a victory garden is? <laughs> right? A victory garden, right? World War II. How many victory gardens were there in World War II? 15 million. Several. 15 million gardens. Right, it's 15 million gardens, and then the war was over, and you don't need it anymore, right? It's just people growing their food, trading it for, I mean, that's, that's a hugely like, uh, enormous thing. And then, how many of you here have, uh, have, been to, uh, have been to Harlem? Right, over 80% diabetes rate up there, why is that? Because when you go to the store, you're going to the corner store to get Snapple and chips, you know? It's like access to organic food, access to uh, 
to healthy food, right? That's, so I just really want to reiterate, I'm sure the last talk was a lot about that a lot, uh, was about that a lot, is the idea of food justice, the idea that people, that social justice is directly related to people's access to health and people's access to like good food. And I really recommend you guys checking out um, ryanishungry.com for some videos of like people in West Oakland kind of retaking plots of land and growing stuff there and growing things on top of elementary schools. Um, all right, cool. So. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the, set of the equipment that we've been working on. None of this equipment is actually kind of working past the prototype model yet, but you know, it's really fun to make kitchen equipment. And really, how many people here are hardware hackers? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, what just happened there? Did you? See? <laughs> well, so uh, so we got some friends and we do some hardware hacking, right? So I was just in Japan for a while. Uh, I have some interesting pictures from Japan. Maybe I'll show them to you. This is uh, oh this is this is from one of our supper clubs. A bunch of kids are over there. This is us. Uh, this is actually corn corn cobs and corn husks being fried, and then we add water to it and make a stock out of it because you're paying for those corn cobs and corn husks. Why shouldn't you get the flavor out of them? Uh, this is uh, this is Japan, right? This is bonito. How many of you here know what bonito is? Right? It's the it's the f it's the flakes that you use for miso soup. So this is uh, this is seared bonito tataki. And this kid right here, 17 years old, he's grilling. He has, a, he has Benito on a pitchfork with one hand over fire, and he's throwing straw on it with the other. And it's the best thing I ever had, and he's been making it that way for 3,000 years, or someone like him, right? And so, of course, just some good pictures. God Burger, of course, your favorite. <laughs> you got to have some English in there. Uh, New Year's Eve, I, all these virgins at this shrine were serving a sake, so I don't know what that's all about. And uh, some you know, fried rice stuff. This is this beautiful, this is like 7 in the morning, snowing, beautiful bowl of soup that all these like, little old ladies are out here eating it, you know, in the snow, uh, trying to like, sell their stuff. Um, I don't remember why I was talking about Japan for a second. Oh yeah, um, so I went to Japan, and I did some dinner parties there, and my chef friend is like, what are you using a whisk for to make a mayonnaise? You should use chopsticks. Has anyone here done chopsticks to make mayonnaise or anything like that? Has anyone right? here made mayonnaise? Has anyone here made mayonnaise? Okay. With their bodies? <laughs> Putting a man in mayonnaise. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Please, it's personas. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so, uh, so I started whisking to make a mayonnaise. And when, you, you know, when you're making a mayonnaise, it's an egg yolk and a you know, cup of oil or something like that. And you're kind of making emulsification, this big web of protein and fat and air. And you're kind of making it. It's nice and mayonnaise -y. A little bit easier to do it with chopsticks, actually, right? And actually, it actually fixes it if you, because you break it sometimes when you're doing it with a whisk. And metal's not touching your food. It's bamboo touching your food, which is a little nicer because it's not giving off ions, right? It's just leaving splinters in it. So, uh, <laughs> so I got back, and I live in San Francisco. And what's the great thing about San Francisco? vibrator stores on every corner. So good vibrations, does everyone know what good vibrations is? So yeah, good vibrations. So I go up and I get one of these hand things that kind of moves, it looks like a hand, and uh, we're basically call, hauling it out and putting a uh, uh, potentiometer on it so you can turn it up and clamping chopsticks onto it. <laughs> and it, it's, it's called the chop whisker, and you're basically holding someone else's hand and turning up a thing and whisking but you don't have to hurt your hand whisking, actually. It's just wood. And, and wood's touching your food, not metal. So that's like kind of the weird equipment. Can I talk about some other equipment hacks? Um, this, one, th this is the one. Uh, is that stuff all gone? Yeah. Right. Oh, well, how was, the, how was the cake again, you guys? You feeling it? All right, good. All right, beautiful. If, uh, so another, another, we, have this friend, uh, we have this friend, Zaz, who's doing this show, Prototype This, with uh, little Joey Grand, Kingpin. Uh, is anyone here, any of those people here tonight? Anyway, so he's helping us uh, make a centrifuge with, uh, and so a centrifuge is spinning something really super fast, really. And uh, you have, um, we basically, it's, it's a centrifuge for Pousse Cafe. So well, the thing about centrifuges is you're changing the density of the liquid in it. And so it's a metal pint glass centrifuge. So you put like, you know, different kinds of alcohol in it and it gets them up to different densities. So you can make a Pousse Cafe out of a, la a layer drink with arbitrary alcohols, right? Because normally when you make a drink, what's the RGB, right? What's in the RGB? Uh, I don't know. It's a shot. It's a hacker some shot. Red, some green, some blue. It's a Maduri, Maduri uh, Curacao, 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 Curacao and Grenadine or Aftershock. Aftershock. After, so it's RGB. So pure Grenadine would be Right, yeah. Well, I don't know. So, it's, you know, if, if you guys ever want to make an RGB, uh, Veggie will be pouring RGB shots at the, at the Blarney Rock later this evening. So, you kind of pour it over a spoon, you're like relaying on the density of the things to kind of layer up, but you can change the density of those things with the centrifuge. So, with a pint glass, maybe, so maybe we'll have that ready for, by the cocktail uh, um, festival in, in Austria or whatever. So, you can actually kind of dial up how, what layers uh, you want your um, alcoholic drink to be. Uh, what are some other stuff? Oh, the Bellagio Bowl. How many people have been to the Bellagio? So this is a, it's a ceramic bowl. There's the fountain at the Bellagio, right? So it's a ceramic bowl with little holes drilled into it, hooked up to a, uh, a uh, dental irrigator. How many of you here brush your teeth? <laughs> so 
weird. Uh, and then how many of you here use dental irrigators? Well, dental irrigators are awesome. So the best thing to do with dental irrigators, I'll talk about how it works in this bowl for a second, is you fill it up with marshmallow dough. Um, eh, whatever, and then, and, then, and then you write something in cursive, and then you cook the marshmallow, and it's a cursive marshmallow with changing colors. So you should check that out, it's pretty fat. Anyway, so, uh, so the Bellagio bowl has an irrigator, and it basically uh, has, little RG, has little RGB LEDs around the edge of the bowl, and then you pour in your like, really nice corn consomme or veal consomme or something like that, and it kind of, you turn it on, and it starts spraying it into the bowl with a little RGB LED light show. It's very pretty. You know, you're like, anyway. <laughs> So uh, that's cool. What else? Oh yeah, vacuum mold sieves. I don't have a picture of this either, but it's a, a sieve is like you have an, it's, it's something you pour something through um, to you know, strain it. It's like a strainer. You can get nice medical grade, not medical, but scientific grade sieves are like you know, 90 micron, 30 micron. You know, pieces of fat don't go through it. Excuse me. And so uh, you, you, classically, you just kind of rub something through the sieve. But we're trying to use a vacuum um, pump to suck the thing through the sieve, right? It's using a vacuum form, a vacuum form thing. Okay, let me talk a little bit about a couple of the other really weird food things we've been doing. Actually, we're at the part where we're going to talk about food games. How many of you here know what surrealism is? All right, beautiful. Uh, so I need, can you just come up here for a second? With like three of you? <laughs> okay. That's two. Uh, this is, yeah, and one more person. Just anybody. Math is hard. Yeah. <laughs> so fold this, fold this in, th fold this in thirds, fold this in thirds, and take a pen. This is a trick we learned. Uh, this is like the exquisite corpse game. So take you're, what you're going to do is you're going to fold each of it, these papers in thirds and write an arbitrary piece of food. Don't even think about it. Just take a pen, write a piece of food on it, fold it over, and give it to the next person. Right. And then, and then keep, and then, so you won't be able to see what you wrote before. So just go ahead and write a piece of food on it and pass it to the next person, and then kind of go in a circle. And then we'll undo it, and I'll show you something kind of interesting about it. So we'll get back to that in a second. So the thing I like about surrealist food games is this: the living, last living surrealist is Leonora Carrington. She's like 90 something years old, lives in Mexico City. People would sleep over her house, and she would cut their hair off in the middle of the night, and then make it, and then serve them an omelet in the morning that had their own hair in it. <laughs> How cool is that? I'm sure people, plus they're like surrealist artists, so you know they're in love with themselves, and they really, they really, are you guys all right with that? You guys, you're passing it the right way and all that? No, we're passing Oh yeah, don't, ex don't exchange, uh, kind of have to rotate. Yeah. Yeah, you pass, yeah, pass to him, pass to him, and then around to the other side. So never feel, never, yeah, you got it? All right, oh, that's okay, you could, you could fail. Just write something really random. So the idea is like surrealist food games, like Exquisite Corpse, anyone know what Exquisite Corpse is? The surrealist game, where you say, you start, just people stand in a circle and kind of say a sentence, right? And you just add whatever word you want. And the original one was like, the exquisite corpse, you know, whatever it was, went to town or something. Jumped over the, the lazy brown dog. Okay, so um, we're going to do this. Are right, you guys all done? All right, so I'm going to show you some gross food things that we've been working on. Uh, so as far as the, because it's kind of inspiring, I think, to um, make gross food things. Okay, so here's one that's been called toe cheese. You might want to look away. Uh, so I ripped off my toenail. Aww. I know, right? It sucks, right? Here's my toenail. And I'll just leave it. Okay, you guys ready? Uh, to finish the paper, what do you got? Where are your papers at? <laughs> Should I just leave this up? Okay, so, uh, so come here, come here. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. Okay, uh, read yours out loud. What do you got? Read this one. Read in here. Corn, shrimp, walnut. Okay, so what's, what's that? Corn, shrimp, walnuts. It's like a shrimp salad with corn and walnuts in it, right? It works. What about you? Uh, omelet, popcorn, celery. Omelet, uh, popcorn, celery, omelet. How delicious does that sound? What do you got? Um, dumpling, potato, jello. Nice. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. And so these things all sound delicious, right? I mean, see, so you, you know, you make, you know, jello on the inside, a dumpling around, pump potato dumpling with a little jello center, right? It'd be kind of weird, but it'd be pretty good. And so the, the thing that we learn here is that you kind of are jumping outside your comfort zone. You're, you're thinking of a random pairing because and it's also, uh, the, whole, the whole point of Exquisite Corpse is it's expressing the, co the collective aesthetic, right? Where all the people who are standing in a group kind of saying words, it's the words that would come to them because they're, you know, in an art, you know, in an art group or whatever. So it's the same thing with people in a kitchen. You kind of say, here's a random thing, here's a random thing. And the thing I've learned from doing this game and kind of making dinner, dinner parties based on this game is um, that uh, <clears throat> everything goes with everything. That's the trick, man. As long as there's something that connects it to something else, Right? So there's a, there's a dish at the fat duck that was mango and pine, right? 
And the, and the trick is, is that it's got a, it's got a, it's got a terpene in it called pinene that's it's characteristic flavor of pine needles, right? But it's also in some mangoes. And so when you eat it, you know, it's, there's this thing that ties it together, ties the mango together with the pine. You have this like synergy in your mouth. Okay, so back to the toe cheese. Uh, so basically, ripped off my toenail, um, salted it down, dre dremeled off the uh, dremel off the little the uh, some a layer of it, so it's very thin, and then using that to flavor a milk, and then kind of growing the cheese off of the toenail, and it's in progress right now. And we kind of imagine this as a uh, we kind of imagine this as a to service thing, right? You go up and say, would Madame or Monsieur like some toe cheese? You know, come back in a month, and you just rip off the toenail for service, <laughs> and you dremel it down, but. But don't you really like the taste of your own toes, right? Someone else's toe cheese, maybe not that's great. All right, so, uh, so, that's, so that's one of the experiments. We have, we have also, um, oh, this is kind of gross, uh, chocolate onkimo. How many of you know what onkimo is, right? It's like the foie gras fish. It's monkfish liver, right? And it's pretty nice, and uh, so we have a bunch of monkfish liver, and I thought, well, you know, how, how nice would that be if we ended up um, soaking it with chocolate? So we got this uh, little macadamia oil and the Godiva chocolate liqueur. Uh, so this is the monkfish liver right there. And we kind of uh, marinated it with that and then ended up steaming it like normal. Like, in a, you know, you kind of poke holes in it, wrap it in foil. And it was, you know, chocolate flavored liver. It's a kind of a similar thing of like when you do chocolate and foie gras. There's a lot of fattiness, so the fat is kind of tying it together in the mouthfeel. So, by the way, it was gross. Um, <laughs> But you know you got you got to learn those things. Um, oh, this is interesting. This is kind of messing with uh, isopropyl hash. How many of you here um, uh, experiment with making drugs? Any of you here? <laughs> but we have a huge section on our website about uh, this. This is way you can make hash by you add isopropyl alcohol to like weed leaves and uh, you kind of like let it sit for a couple of days and then boil it off on an electric server uh, on an electric stove. You know, with a lot of ventilation, you have like you're kind of making hash. And so we were doing that with wormwood, mugwort, and tonka bean. And so we kind of would cover the wormwood or the mugwort. Here they are, kind of covered. Um, and then you kind of strain it, and you have this kind of really dark green, murky, murky liquid. And then you kind of cook it down on an electric stove, and it starts uh, kind of like precipitating out of the solution. Like all, and what's precipitating out is thujone, right? And then here we have this block of thujone. It's like a little tarry block of hash. And so you kind of smoke that and get a little, you know, get a little, ooh. So, so uh, you know, the idea is you know you're kind of doing things um, with food that you know you haven't intended. So it's you know you're kind of using isopropyl to thujone's an interesting drug actually. It's the same thing that's in it's in sage. It's a molecule that's in sage too. It's supposed to be the active ingredient in absinthe, but who knows? And it uh, you know you have Anyway, it's an interesting drug, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later if you guys want to meet us at the Blarney Rock. So uh, then one of the other ones, uh, a friend of mine, Rudy Rucker, he wrote this book called Hacker and the Ants. Everyone read Hacker and the Ants? Yes. Right? So we have the food hacker and the ants, right? So these are ant venom gumdrops. So how many of you have eaten ants? Come on. There you go. Raise your hand a little bit. So you know that, that really sharp kind of sour flavor? We actually went to an insect place. Let me see if I can remember the uh, URL to this. Is this right? No, it's, maybe there's a dash in it. No, that's not it. Maybe that can not come. Some service out there that would allow you to look it up. Right. <laughs> Here we go. So we went to this insect place in uh, in uh, Santa Monica Airport of all places called Typhoon Not Biz, and there I'm eating a cockroach, <clears throat> and it's uh, you know it tastes like shit, of course, but it also tastes like bananas, right? So like you kind of think about the hack of that. You stuff it with bananas, maybe you deep fry it, and then you put a little powdered sugar on it, and it's like a roach banana funnel cake. You know, it's like a little you know you kind of bringing someone back to that kind of an idea. Uh, so we ate some ants there, and ants are really nice. They they kind of taste like sweet tarts. They have venom in it, which is this formic acid, and then ethyl formate is this. Um, is this uh, when you add ethanol to that, and it's the characteristic flavor of raspberries and, and taste of rum. So uh, we made these gumdrops out of 151, and then these raspberries are kind of soaked in Chambord, which is a black raspberry liqueur. And we made these gumdrops out of 151, and then we kind of blazed the top of it and, uh, with a torch and dropped ants on top of it. And so when you eat this, you're actually eating, this is an homage to Rudy Rucker who did Hacker and the Ants. Uh, so when you eat it, you're, you're tasting ant venom, right? But you're also tasting alcohol, and you're tasting raspberries, and you're tasting rum. So anyway, this is kind of some of the weird kind of food gamey stuff. So we have a little bit of time left. Uh, any questions so far, by the way? <laughs> All right, good. Um, what's our next thing? Oh yeah, so we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna, now we're gonna talk about um, software a little bit. So this is software we wrote called Delicious Corpse, and uh, it's pretty delicious. And it's basically, it's a, it's a kind of, it's kind of like Exquisite Corpse, but it's with food. And you can kind of specify, um, all of the ingredients that you want to put in it. So every time you reload Delicious Corpse, it says frog's legs perfumed wasabi gnocchi, muscle praline, beef tongue scented medjool date gastrique, 
right? It just kind of makes up weird things. Truffled prosciutto pesto, sounds pretty good. Caramelized basil glaze. And you can say I'm vegan, right? And you can uh, show me a random menu, and it'll kind of you know, get rid of meat, dairy, and seafood. And so it'll be kind of boring. But um, you know, Persian artichoke waffle. Doesn't that sound good? Quinoa enchiladas, grilled perno foam. And then you can also go here in your shopping list and you can add things like uh, man, woman, dog, cat, God, Jesus, Allah, Buddha. <laughs> right? And then, and then it kind of, it's a semantic engine that kind of just makes you a menu on these people. And um, deep fried Jesus galette, of course. <laughs> and then, uh, ooh, grilled cat kimchi, man encrusted Jesus souffle. Jesus baked cat twill. That's a really good one. And so, of course, we put, uh, we put a bunch of diseases in it because that's really funny. Everyone likes diseases. Scurvy vinegar, charred scurvy. Isn't that, isn't that the, the height of irony? Scurvy vinegar. You have, because scurvy is from lack of vitamin C. And, anyway, sorry. Um, uh, shaved syphilis satay, fermented AIDS loaf, pulled rickets. Uh, and then we had, you know, a bunch of random things like uh, insects, of course, and... Um, this is a blazing fast website. Grub and fly, so mealworm poached hornet lollipop, dung beetle baked moth galette. And so you're just kind of changing random things. And we also have the religions, of course, which, are, which everyone loves. Uh, liquid nitrogen cockroach, fruit fly sandwich. Individually wrapped Rastafarian loaf. That's pretty good. <laughs> and Episcopalian smoked cult foam, Calvinist encrusted Methodist and Roman Catholic velute. Lutheran cheesecake. Isn't that a Dead Milkman album? <laughs> Some Methodist coloring book. And then we also have uh, kind of San Francisco neighborhoods was really cute too. If anyone, anyway, San Francisco is the center of the world of people who live there. So, so uh, this is kind of a weird little game. And, and so we're kind of working on another version of this, but like, but kind of look at Polish North Beach, roasty salt. Anyway, so kind of looking at, uh, it's kind of a Google bomb in a lot of ways too. So you can kind of like add your favorite one or whatever. So if you look at, uh, we did a little research on the logs and we said, well, there's three main groups of people that are getting here from Google traffic, right? There's like uh, people who are typing in lists of ingredients like chicken liver, salmon filet, duck breast, clams. Give me a recipe, right? Or Italian lamb shank mint. They're kind of typing in things that they either have in their kitchen or that they want um, in a dish looking for a recipe. The second biggest list is uh, type names of products. People are typing in Moroccan cheese or dehydrated avocado or raw Marcona almond or Hamoub cacao. This is kind of weird. Uh, my cat's name is Hamoub. Um, so, and then the largest group is people who are typing in weird shit, right? <laughs> Broccoli cheesecake, um, mushroom vinegar, what else we got? Uh, chard arugula, no, that's not so, hibiscus ravioli, monkfish pie, uh, deep-fried pine nut, maybe that's not so weird, potato cannoli. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, strawberry ceviche, watermelon caviar, tuna cheesecake, um, Vegemite curry. That's kind of, yeah, that's good, right? Actually, speaking of Vegemite, we'll jump in. So, so, the, this, this, so this recipe, this, so I, I really like this as far as like thinking about the DNA thing out there, like you kind of copywriting the, the, the genome, right? You're kind of like saying, oh, this weird thing you just thought of, nasturtium jelly, oh, we already thought of it, right? And so the next step of the software is how to actually create that recipe. Well, this is the semantic web engine. So before we get to that, I just want to take all the, to all the people who are saying weird, uh, ooh, about the Vegemite thing. How many of you here hate Vegemite? Oh man, it's horrible. So Vegemite is this thing that you know made the Australians not starve during World War II. So we love it for that. And so here's a bunch of Vegemite. And we had during this vegan hack lab, we actually uh, poached Satan. Satan. Does everyone know what Satan is? Satan. Hail Satan. Uh, it's you know it's it's wheat wheat protein. We actually poached it in a Vegemite stock. So we made this Vegemite stock. And so the, this kind of protein. What? What does that mean? Right. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, you mean okay. Well, Weird. Yeah, I, didn't, I have no idea what that is, but I'll check it out. So anyway, the, it's, it's a Satan that kind of smells like, a, tastes like a nutritional yeast. Okay, so, um, so I'm just saying that Vegemite, it actually tasted pretty nice as far as making a Vegemite stock and then, because you're always kind of putting a flavor into Satan, right? So you kind of like make an orange juice and, and um, lemongrass stock and then poach the Satan in it and it kind of tastes like that. Or, you know, put chai and cumin and cinnamon and it kind of tastes like Indian lamb. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the new version of Delicious Corpse, which is this uh, kind of this semantic web backend, which came from this, these, uh, the current version of Delicious Corpse and thinking, well, we actually want to create recipes for each of these things, right? I want to, I want to be able to say all those recipes that are out there, if you can think of it, well, you're just feeding it into our interface so we can actually disassemble it and create it. So I started making kind of a visual interface of like how to, how to mouse over, you know, different kinds of things. We also kind of were thinking about... Um, 
the visualization of, of, of recipes and how it's really a pain in the ass to read recipes on the internet. There's a couple hundred thousand recipes on the internet and they all kind of are a pain in the ass to read. So there's this thing called Delicious Corpse. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a visual recipe builder. Let me get rid of this one really quick. It's a visual, oh, there's the toe again. <laughs> you guys, surely you would eat toe cheese, right? No, not so much. Uh, let's see, savories. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the Delicious Corpse, okay. So we basically started making these semantic engines where you started thinking about things um, as different effects, like trigeminal effects in the mouth, kind of have a scripting language trying to define every food. So you know, uh, you can think of textures and the different regions and cuisines, and you know that Filipino food is all stinky and smelly, right? It's like stinky and sour, kind of, and the different phases of matter. This is all kind of a scripting language right here for knowing that you know, all solids, you can kind of chop them, right? but you can't chop water because it's not a solid unless you freeze it and it changes the phase. So started building the semantic web engine a while back, and so you're able to say things like chocolate is solid, it's liquid, it's fat, it's sweet, it's bitter, and the Mexicans um, you know, spice it. You know? um, and then you have a lot of preparations as well, and you're kind of, uh, so this is like kind of more scripting languages for that. And then we actually have, um, here's, here's one of the, the recipe pages for it. So this is kind of a visual interface for French onion soup, right? And so you're looking at the pictures of the ingredients and you have all these kind of um, you know, prep icons around. If you click on France up in the corner, you can change it to Moroccan onion soup and it'll change, it'll add like onions or orange zest and cinnamon, right? You change onion to butternut and it'll make a French butternut soup just using the same ingredients. You click on soup and change it to souffle and it makes a souffle out of the same ingredients. So there's a badge that you can put on to recipes that are on the internet to drag it into this visual, Delicious Corpse visual recipe builder. And then let me see if I can grab one of these guys really quick. So there's these you know, sliders on the side that uh, allow you to, this is a bad example, let me say it. Here we go. So this is another French onion soup. And the thing is, is every time you change something, it automatically updates the instructions down there, right? And so then, of course, you have all these different kinds of sliders on the side that allow you to say, you know, the skill is easy and it doesn't take a lot. Of, it takes 45 minutes, but you want to speed it up, you know? So if you drag that down, maybe semantically in the back end, it changes the braised cabbage to a shredded cabbage, right? Or the number of people it are, so you can, it, it serves, so you can scale it up, or the, or the cost it is. And so it's a way for you to bring in, let's say, a recipe for meatloaf that you like on the internet or from your mom's cookbook, kind of model it in this and then say, make a vegetarian. Because you can, you can ascribe your own diet stuff onto it as well. You can say, uh, make, um, I'm, you know, I like, I'm allergic to peanuts or whatever. And kind of this food picker over here, this little sphere is kind of helping you kind of navigate and suggest new things for you to eat that you might like to add to it. So the use case is this, what's in my fridge? And I want an Asian raw foods menu out of what's in my fridge and, I'm, and you know I'm allergic to peanuts, go. I only want food grown within 100 miles from here, go. Or I'm in a grocery store with my iPhone and you know, it already knows what's in my house and I'm gonna have a German meal tonight or something like that. And so it kind of keeps track of dietary issues, uh, kind of it's a social network you know, aspect as well where you can kind of see what your friends are eating and how, how your diets work. Um, yeah, so it's a huge, huge back end, right? So here's, here's an example of one of the back end things which is this, uh, the aroma wheel. So this is a wine thing. Um, let's see if we can make this a little bigger. So this is the aroma, aroma wheel for wine pairing, right? So you drink wine, you say it's fruity. What kind of fruity? Tropical fruity, tastes like pineapple, right? All right, thanks. And uh, so this is, um, uh, so I wrote this kind of interface to it that allows you to kind of create this, uh, you, you can just run aroma.pl and just say, I want, uh, let's say, vanilla, right? And it'll kind of tell you its siblings for the aroma wheel are cedar and oak, and it's in the woody family, and it's resinous. So it kind of points to the other cousins if you give it a control flag that says that, um, so it's a way to kind of create an aroma wheel that's personalized based on one person. So I'm interested in talking about it a little more. I don't have a lot of time left. Um, if you enjoyed this talk, I really encourage uh, you to buy us drinks at the Blarney Rock later. So <laughs> thanks a lot for that. I'm just gonna open up the questions right now because I think that's really fun. Uh, yeah, Tochi's questions. Any questions? There are microphones. There are microphones. The microphones. In the corridor there. Veggie, what's your question? You got a microphone? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any? Version, I can't uh, does, hear. Does that second version work? Parts of it do, but I'm not an interface person, so I haven't hooked up the interface stuff to the back end. So if you want a command line version or an API Is stuff, it open source? Is it available uh, it's, it's in progress. If you're interested in helping out, you're totally down for it, but there's no licensing for it now. It's not, uh, it's all testing or whatever.
Because this is really amazing. It's blowing cool. my mind. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's also, it's, I just want to say a little bit about the feature set for it since you guys are kind of interested in it, which is that you, know, you have a restaurant and you go into a restaurant and they say, oh, we know you like mangoes and, and cumin, so here's your dessert that has this in that. You know, it's kind of a flavor profiling. You're actually able to check out the taste gestalt of the entire, you can go to a restaurant and say, we know you're a classical Italian restaurant and all your people who are, live in your same zip code want more seafood, so put a seafood dish on. Yeah, what's up? What's the most horrifically disgusting thing you've ever made <laughs> um, and eaten? <laughs> with my body or like food-wise? Food-wise. <laughs> um, I, I made some really, I was, a friend of mine was like lactose intolerant and doesn't have soy, so I was making, I was trying to do a bunch of weird stuff out of fake cheeses, and that, that, some of that stuff was really, really foul. What about the um, bacon cake? Oh yeah, ba no, bacon cake's pretty good actually. I mean, we do a lot of bacony stuff, so it's like you know, candy bacon and whatnot. I can't really think of anything totally. I'd, I'd have to say it was the wormwood mayonnaise. Have you ever made yourself sick with anything you made? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I um, what did I have recently that made me really sick? I can't remember what it was, but yeah, no, totally. No, I actually, I actually just recovered from a near ulcer the other day, and uh, it was really bad. Sorry. What's okay, all the questions? What was the greatest, most successful thing you ever made? Bacon cake. Um, su sweet love to this man right here. Uh, most successful thing, God. I mean, I just love it. So, I mean, it's, I don't really care about, like, okay, it's really hard the for, greatest I, thing I just want to say another point about us getting exploited, which is people try and, like, we've had, like, um, you know, David Letterman, The View, ABC, BBC, try and get in touch with us and exploit our shit and be like, you have a great idea. Let's do a you know, reality TV show. And it's like, great. So what you're saying is, take this thing that I love and, do, and I'm trying to you know, have an inner relationship with all these people that are important in my life, including everyone in this room, and you know, sell it for ad money. Thanks a lot. Fuck you very much. And so we're making our own media. And I think that when you say, what's the greatest thing? I think the greatest thing we've done is created connections to everybody. I mean, I can literally see all my friends in this world and be like, we cooked together. You know, we made this awesome shit. So that's more important to me than the actual flavor of everything. Yeah. All right. Four minutes? What else you got? Any other questions? Well, I really meant what was the greatest one recipe you made or the yeah. one <laughs> not right. the greatest thing you ever did um, in your life. Yeah. You know, you know what I really love? What I really love is... Uh, um, I made this really thing, it was vegan, and it, who here likes split pea soup, right? It's great, right? Because there's a big hunk of pig in it. So how do you make a vegan version? The Millennium Cookbook has a really shitty recipe where they <coughs> smoke the sea vegetable called dulse, it's really, hot. It's really horrible. So we actually smoked um, fennel over hickory chips. Um, I think we have a picture of that somewhere because not everyone knows what fennel is, but whatever. Um, so we smoked fennel over hickory chips and, uh, and kind of soaked the hickory chips in, in, in um, raisin liqueur and then we made, we kind of pureed that, made a velouté, and we made these cute little um, uh, souffles out of uh, smoked fennel split pea soup souffles. So, so the main thing is we did, we're kind of riffing on this. We made a split pea soup that had peas and smoked fennel velouté, and it was a, you, you taste them side by side to the pig um, split pea soup, the one that has meat in it, and no one liked the meat one compared with the smoked fennel. And then we ended up taking that and putting it into a souffle, so you had a smoked fennel souffle with a split pea on, or sweet pea on glaze on top of it, which is like a vanilla sweet pea sauce. It's kind of a take, and we put like fennel pollen on it. I really was really proud of that. What's up? Oh, also, um, also birthday party at the beach, which is where I made, we had this vacuum distillator, and we put like uh, uh, hemp rope, oyster shells, and um, seaweed in it, and kind of boiled it and condensed the steam, so it tastes like the beach, and then add that with like birthday with uh, <laughs> vanilla cake batter, so it tastes like you're having a birthday party on the beach. It's <laughs> kind of cool. Uh, what's up? Last, maybe last question? You, sir? Yeah. Uh, not really a question, but a piece of information I would like to share. Uh, in Germany, O'Reilly published a cookbook for geeks with modular recipes, uh, UML diagrams for uh, like modular muffins. You can choose and pick <laughs> ingredients. Uh, they also grouped it in a periodic system of food, uh, of nice. nutrients, uh, things like that. Uh, right. If there's anybody from O'Reilly here, uh, I'm please, please translate this book to English, because it's really yeah. great. Great. Any other uh, hawking of O'Reilly products? Anyone else wants to? Uh... Oh. Right. Can you give I your, think you know. Can you give your URL? Yeah, foodhacking.com. And I'll, at the Blarney Rocks, the bar across the street. So come later and buy us drinks if you like the talk. I also want to say that it, I think it's O'Reilly really that made the jump into saying that things are hacking, right? That aren't that aren't necessarily using the computers, right? I mean, they have all these different kinds of hacks, like map hacks. Maybe that's at least contributed to it, you know, as far as the popular, the popular perception of hacking not being bad. What's up? Cool. 
Can you talk a little bit about uh, Unicorn thir Unicorn thir Precinct 13? Is that what it was called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would love to. I would love to. UP13.org. It's a hacker bed and breakfast. It's a family house. It's in San Francisco. There's events. Um, there's a lot of projects, a lot of art out of it. There's a lot of crap in the basement. Tons of people at this conference actually used to live there. We have dinner parties there. Uh, it's about to close for construction. Everyone lives in group houses and stuff like that. So, you know, get a bunch of your friends, move into a house, give it a cool name. Unicorn Precinct 14, I don't think it's taken. And, uh, and then cook, and cook dinner with all your friends. Thanks very much, bye. <laughs>